let's begin with perhaps a, a simple question. Uh, what is justice? Western philosophers, and I think we start off with them, we can't just confine ourselves to them, look at four different kinds of justice. They talk about distributive justice, which is how benefits like power, wealth and status should be distributed, and also how burdens, uh, responsibilities and duties, uh, uh, do you pay tax, should be distributed among individuals and groups. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the one that the most discussion about. You've heard of utilitarianism, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, and so forth. And it's mainly focusing on the economic dimension of justice, or? Uh, well, it's actually, it's all power, wealth, and status. Uh, so it's actually all the power, things that wealth, and status. Or status. Mm -hmm. And status. So it's really all the good things of life, how the good things of life should be distributed. And I think it's important that the things that people value are not just money. Uh, but actually their respect they're held within the community in matters of status and also of course the influence that they can have upon others. So distributive justice is about all the dis distributions of those things human beings value and also the things that they, uh, the burdens that they have to bear. So how they uh, are given the possibility to, ac to, to have access to them in a relatively fair fashion? Yes, well, fairness is, fairness is another way of describing it, a uh, matter of justice. Uh, how should these things be? Should it be on the basis of merit? Should it be on the basis of equality of opportunity? Should it be based on some extent on the uh, equality of outcome? Should it actually be a matter of effort? Should people choose that uh, to work harder and have more money, uh, work less? Uh, Burton Russell wrote a book called In Praise of Idleness, and where he said that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, if people decided to want to devote all of their lives to work, they should expect more results. But if they decide, no, I want to work less, that is actually a perfectly appropriate decision for people to make. So there are lots of different theories which we debated. Utilitarianism is one of the most famous famous ones, mm -hmm. but the other one that's dominated the last century is that, uh, that uh, benefits uh, should go according to human rights. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many theories uh, about how uh, the benefits and burdens of life should be distributed. And that's distributive justice. So, so, so the, 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 uh, the essence of your definition of distributive justice is the es uh, what, what is your definition? How benefits yes. are distributed and burdens are distributed among individuals okay. and groups. So that's uh, the core of the definition of uh, redistributive justice. Distributive justice. Or di distributive justice. Although redistributive justice is an interesting one because okay. that is a question if where you do have uh, an unfair or unjust uh, distribution of burdens and benefits, mm -hmm. then the redistributive justice is, if you like, a ver an element of distributive justice as how do you rectify it's, that. So it's matters. a corrective version of yes. distributive justice, but within the framework of distributive justice. Distributive justice, yes. Okay. So this is one kind of, of, of theory of justice, definition of justice? One kind of justice. Okay. And I, I said different, this is one kind of There are different theories of the justice, distributive yes. justice. The second kind is uh, retributive justice, okay. about people getting just desserts, those who have done the wrong thing, uh, and ensuring that, uh, that they actually suffer on, a, on account of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the uh, uh, eye for an eye and so forth. But it's also questions uh, utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham would emphasise that retributive justice is actually useful uh, as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's useful for re rehabilitation. And it's also for those people who are incorrigible offenders to uh, actually just take them out of society. So retributive justice is uh, mainly pursued in the context of a justice system or does it expand or does it exist beyond uh, a justice system or a penal system? Well, that's a really interesting question. Perhaps we go on to procedural justice because you could have retributive justice in the sense that one says that um, that person killed me. Oh, sorry. So that person killed mm. my, my, my uh, uh, unless we're going to take, take this out of the, super, the supernatural, uh, that person killed, killed, killed my brother, I will go and kill him. Mm -hmm. Now, outside of a justice system, you might say that's retributive justice mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that the person has been punished uh, for his or, his or her wrongdoing. Yes. Uh, this brings another question, of course, when we talk about procedural justice, about how you do it. But retributive justice is that someone has done something wrong and they deserve uh, a negative outcome and the negative outcome so is, is, is imposed. Uh, correcting something and in a way getting even. Uh, well, yes. Before getting even, it's uh, another... Uh, yes, and the idea of justice is that what, um, what should getting even involve? Mm -hmm. What are the appropriate punishments for particular forms of wrongdoing? Mm -hmm. And that is the issue of uh, retributive justice. Yes. Okay, so distributive justice, retributive, retributive justice. justice. Restorative justice Restorative is something justice. that is talked about much more recently. Whereas retributive justice 
looks at uh, punishing the wrongdoer. Restorative justice looks very much at the victim mm. and how the victim has suffered. And uh, the idea of restorative justice, in theory, is to restore them to the position that they were before the crime was done. Uh, but really it's to look at sort of how, in fact, uh, you attempt to address the harm done to victims. Sometimes you can try to put them back in the same position, but often it's a question of what's appropriate given that you can't put them back in the same position as if the crime hadn't been occurred. Mm -hmm. and so that's the difference, retributive and restorative. It, one looks very much at the perpetrator and the other one looks at the victim. And, and you, you just said that it's a more recent uh, kind of justice. So uh, why is it the case and in which context? In which context is this uh, notion of restorative justice uh, arising? That, that's a good point because actually when I say it's more recent, it's more recent in uh, Western philosophy and uh, in discussions in the justice system itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think that restorative justice uh, has a very long tradition in, inform in informal justice. Uh, and uh, it's in probably traditional just in, tradi tra tra in traditional systems. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a great deal uh, one may look down upon those societies or uh, in which um, if someone is killed, the thing is that one family uh, provides um, goods, mm -hmm. uh, valuable goods to the other, whether they be in kind or in cash, uh, because somebody has been killed. Mm -hmm. But in many ways that's recognising that, well, the person can't be brought back to life, but the thing is that there is an appropriate way in which the thing is that there can be at least some degree of, uh, of, 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 rec of recompense. And these days in modern, in modern justice systems, it's often saying, well, look at the, uh, helping the, uh, the perpetrator confront what he or she has done, to recognise the harm they've done to another, and to try to ensure that, the, uh, that they do things that can actually uh, improve the life of those, those that have suffered. So would you say that the, uh, the various commissions uh, on uh, truth and reconciliation or of truth and reconciliation in Latin America, in Africa and so on are part of this uh, um, trend when it comes to restorative justice? I think normally a truth and reconciliation commission uh, will, won't go the full extent of restorative justice. I'm not entirely sure you'd necessarily call them fully restorative justice, mm -hmm. but certainly to the extent that it actually gets people, uh, that people actually at least know what happened. Uh, I think that restorative justice is, uh, starts off with the, the confrontation between the, uh, the, uh, the perpetrator and the victim and the admission of, uh, the admission of uh, wrongdoing by the former, and so the latter actually knows what happens in full. I think that uh, restorative justice would actually say, well, in that case, what else should be done in order to benefit those, those, those who are those who have suffered? Not just knowledge of it, which I think is a very important and is the start of restorative justice and the start of lots of other kinds of healing. Yes. Uh, but I think it's, I'm not sure you'd call it restorative justice, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly uh, a move towards that. And so you indicated that in a traditional setting, this kind of a uh, justice, uh, this kind of uh, restorative justice has existed for quite a long time, but has been quite recent in the Western system. Uh, how do you explain this difference and why is it that uh, uh, this version or vision of, of justice uh, is now emerging uh, and why, how do you explain the fact that it didn't exist before? I think in, more narrowly in Western terms, I think that the emergence of restorative justice is a recognising that um, the victims were uh, not particularly present. They were there to give evidence and then they, then they were shooed away. And to some extent the theory was that, uh, that, the, uh, that the victim was the state because its laws had been broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually it was up to the, the state institutions to independently determine how the perpetrator should be punished. Now, this, this, that's a very important rule of law, which yes. will move into, 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 into procedural justice. But there was a feeling that the victim had been left out. And there's also, I think, a feeling that if you, if you didn't force the, um, sorry, give, the, give an opportunity to the victim to actually confront the perpetrator and for the perpetrator to understand what they've done, the chances of rehabilitation for the perpetrator would yeah. be less. And also the feeling of uh, the lack of closure and so forth for the, for the victim. It's also saying, well, let's actually, uh, uh, we, we've traditionally sort of punished uh, at considerable, often quite great expense, uh, yeah. perpetrators. But that hasn't actually benefited in any sense the, so, the victims. So, so in, 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 uh, would you be ready to say that historically in the Western system for a long time uh, the, the justice which has been exercised in the context of the justice and penal system has been essentially 
uh, retributive and not so much restorative, partly because at the center of uh, violation of the law was the quest for order. Um, I think probably the, the reasons for punishing people uh, are complex. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's utilitarian views, which actually, in one sense, uh, treated violation of the norms very seriously, but didn't actually necessarily take a, a moral approach to it. They just said, well, we don't want people to, uh, to breach rules, therefore it's important that sanctions be imposed in order to deter people, and also that uh, those people who were uh, incorrigible offenders or likely to offend, uh, it's a good idea to lock them up for quite a while, but that's a question of incapacitation. And there are others who said, well, actually, uh, uh, in order to reduce future offending, we should, we should actually engage in rehabilitation. That's the utilitarian approaches yeah. to retrib retributive justice. But there are other sort of uh, longer uh, view that uh, actually that fails to recognise that there's a moral dimension to crime and that people who have committed crime should be punished because of their wrongdoing, not because it will increase human happiness, which is the approach to, uh, of, um, of uh, utilitarianism, but because of the moral perfidy of the, of the, of the, of the uh, criminal and uh, the need to actually, uh, to actually uh, them be punished, almost for, for sort of semi-religious reasons. Yeah. Uh, and th there's always been a debate there between the, between the two, but they are often the same as we often find. Uh, in um, big debates in, uh, in philosophy and politics uh, that sometimes the same conclusion can be reached by different people using quite different, uh, dif dif different reasons. And for instance, back to distributive justice, quite often sort of a moderately egalitarian outcome is the result of either utilitarianism or justice and fairness or human rights or uh, uh, at least moderate equalities of outcome uh, or even matters of merit if you consider each individual is equally deserving of, uh, of, of respect. So uh, I think that this, this uh, I'll just want to highlight here, that uh, there may be different theories of justice. Uh, sometimes they can have radically different outcomes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can have different theories which will point to the same, point to the same outcome, and this is the case that we're discussing in retributive justice. Okay. So just to summarize, distributive justice, Distrib uh, retributive, retributive, restorative, restorative and, and procedural justice. So these are the four main categories. Uh, I think that's a, yeah. I mean, other, other people would d divide them in other ways, but yeah. I think they're the most common, common ways of dividing it. And procedural justice yeah. is, the, is the, the way in which uh, laws are, are imposed. And I think it's very important, not just the outcomes, because if you're distributive, restrib distributive, retributive and restorative, are very much about outcomes. Whereas procedural justice is about the means by which uh, those outcomes are achieved. Uh, and this is where we find the, rule, the realm of the rule of law, how laws are implemented, uh, issues of democracy, how laws are made, who and how laws are made, matters of accountability, matters of uh, freedom of expression, matters of transparency. If you like, there's justice not in ends, but justice in means. Now, the two of them, of course, are not unrelated, because we'd often say that, uh, that if, in fact, if, in fact, you don't have an appropriate means, you're not likely to have yeah. the appropriate outcome. Mm -hmm. If, in fact, the thing is that you don't have the rule of law, then it's very unlikely that retribution will go to those who actually deserve it. Uh, and that uh, restoration of rights will go to those who don't, don't deserve it. And if you don't have uh, democracy and the rule of law, the chances of any kind of sort of uh, redistributive pol policies are very un un unlikely to fail. So, in fact, ideally, one would think that these four models uh, should work, would work together. Yes. I think it's worthwhile saying that um, uh, various forms of justice can be conceived of independently and may be actually uh, achieved uh, to various extents at different times, so that you might have one society which is actually strong and retributive and poor on distributive justice. Uh, and you'll often find, I think, that found in, uh, in Western countries which have ultimately developed a strong democratic tradition, it's been more common to find the rule of law, matters of procedural justice, to actually precede uh, democracy and uh, uh, democracy and uh, uh, welfare policies. Uh, I think that this is um, uh, not surprising, and I think that's so. Therefore, it's important we conceive of these concepts of justice separately. But like governance values in general, uh, that each of them tends to be mutually supportive. Mm -hmm. If you have the rule of law and you also have democracy, each is likely to be stronger. Uh, but that they can be, they can they can emerge at different times. And in most European countries, uh, the rule of law emerged before democracy. 
if we have a society which fulfills the requirements of one of its models but somehow uh, is, uh, ignores the requirements uh, of the other three models, of two and, and ignores the, the two remaining, can we uh, evaluate whether or not can we assert or state that this society is just or not? I mean, uh, you, you put forward these four models of justice. Then, you know, the question is, do they work together? You tell us, you, you tell us that they can be working together, but they don't have to work together. Then, how do we uh, state, express um, a, just, a, a statement of justice, if you will? How do we, on the basis of this, this society is just, this society is not just? I think a broad, it, a broad no. statement that this society is just or that society is unjust has relatively little meaning unless you're talking about which kind of justice you're talking okay. about and what theory of justice within that is uh, that, that, you, that you are using. And so, uh, for instance, you might, have, um, you might have some societies which follow, appear, appear to follow a very strong uh, utilitarian approach. Uh, according to uh, what I would see as a bastardised version of utilitarianism, which is uh, market liberalism, where in fact instead of happiness being the ultimate uh, the ultimate goal, it's the uh, it's the maximisation not of happiness but actually of uh, of gross domestic product. Uh, now I think that's actually a not an adequate uh, mm -hmm. understanding of utilitarianism, and it's for even it's perpetrators will not believe that this is the uh, this is uh, this is uh, you can fully equate money with happiness, uh, they would re merely regard this as the only way that you can adequately measure it. Yes. But I think the point is that whenever you're looking at uh, saying this is a just or unjust society, it's important to say which of the elements of justice are you talking about, which are the kinds of justice, and what theory of justice you're mm -hmm. actually trying but, to follow. But, but uh, a regular person, a regular citizen, who hasn't been trained in the field of philosophy, in the field of law, and most people in any given country uh, uh, hasn't been lucky enough to go to university and, and, and study law and philosophy and so on, and economics, and, and yet, you know, uh, citizens, whatever the society, have... Uh, uh, have a feeling about what is just and unjust. So how do they go about this uh, uh, assessment of the justice or lack of justice in the context in which they live? How do you, as a regular person, how do you go about feeling that um, uh, you are being treated uh, fairly or unfairly if you, if you don't know about all these models? Well, I think that uh, uh, it's important if for anybody to say, you know, it is just, this is right, this is wrong. It's important for anybody to say, well, why do I say that? Mm -hmm. uh, now, it doesn't mean that uh, I, I've actually cited, I don't think I've cited a single philosopher so far. Uh, I'm talking about ideas which we can, uh, most of which we can actually appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important if you say it's just or it's right, uh, or justice has been achieved, I think it's very important to say, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. One sense, that's what, that's what philosophers are asking in much greater detail and depth. But we should all do it. If we say, I think this is right, we say, on what basis is it right? And try to generalise that from, uh, and say, well, uh, I'm actually going to respect enormously people who have a feeling this is right or this mm -hmm. is wrong. Uh, my own approach to philosophy is actually, of, uh, of um, uh, and ethics, is actually uh, a version of emotivism. You, you feel strongly, people feel strongly, that is wrong. Uh, and I think it's important you start with that. Say, so why do I think that's wrong? So and then you then you yeah. analyse it. And that I think is what, if not, you don't have to be a philosopher, but if you want to be a, uh, a thinking voter, you'd say, well, I think that's wrong. Well, why do I think it's wrong? And what do I think should be done about it? Yeah. And, and so behind this, uh, or along, you know, going along with you know, being associated with these four models, I guess you have a, a whole set of, of, of uh, arguments to be made about values, about rights, about how people identify with certain values, identify with certain rights, and therefore uh, come to feel and come to think, well, this is not right, this is not, uh, and so on and so on, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So we have these four models. They they can or they don't have to work together. Now, do they apply? I mean, historically, philosophy, for instance, the pursuit of uh, of justice in the context of philosophy has been done uh, at the national level for the national level. So, uh, these uh, models of justice. I mean, do they uh, simply apply to the uh, national level, or can they be somehow uh, used uh, to understand? justice beyond the national realm uh, to understand justice at the global level? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, there's maybe two different ways of, yeah. of looking at it. One of them is the justice always claims to be universal. 
but then those claims of justice uh, emerge within particular historical uh, times, within particular cultures, and in particular kinds of institutional contexts. And um, there are some who tend to um, uh, have a view that uh, all these values are inherently universal. It may be because they are taking them just from a particular religious context, when the religion itself claims to be universal. Uh, it may be because they are so convinced of the values of their culture that they believe that they should be universal. And there has been a tendency for uh, some Western, uh, not just philosophers, more often politicians, to imagine that Western values, uh, that universal values, are basically just Western values exported to the rest of the world. This, I think, is a. F uh, this, I think, uh, is a false and actually um, unfortunate version of universalism, uh, because actually the values that we have in the West themselves are highly contested within the West, and themselves have developed uh, historically uh, and um, uh, institutionally. Uh, I think that. Uh, there are some who suggest that you know, some, you know, there are universal values about you know, uh, always tell the truth, never harm others and so forth. And to some extent there are values that are universal at that level, but it's at an incredibly general level. And I think that um, as somebody who is part lawyer and part philosopher, I would quote, and it's the first philosopher I'm quoting, Amartya Sen, who said that the, um, who talked about Confucianism, and he said Confucianism was extremely advanced for the 6th century BC. But as any philosopher uh, would, uh, would say, uh, actually thinking has improved. There's, if you like, a dialogue with the past, uh, an understanding of how uh, ideas and values were expressed hundreds of years ago, and there's a belief by most philosophers, maybe it's merely to protect their profession, that actually the philosophising and having continuing dialogue with the past and with the future uh, will actually improve the uh, ideas about values. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think there's, if you like, there's a historical dimension. The second is obviously there's a cultural dimension. I think most cultures uh, have, uh, certainly I've discovered, tend to have fairly similar uh, ideas of justice. Uh, they, um, you know, the elements of uh, issues of rights, the rule of law particularly, uh, of the, uh, the value of all human beings and so forth, they tend to, most cultures have these strong values. Uh, they're not identical. Uh, but uh, they are what are called congruent. On the other hand, most cultures are highly authoritarian, quite, sorry to put it, nasty, nasty versions of their values. This is true of all, of all cultures. Uh, so it's not a question of West good, East bad, or East good, West bad. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had in the West, we managed to produce, within a single century, Nazism and Bolshevism, mm -hmm. uh, which, if they're not the two worst uh, governance systems in the world, uh, they're certainly up there trying. Yes. And so that um, I think it's very important that we should see that there are, with all uh, that uh, the kinds of conflicts and problems in every mm -hmm. society tend to throw up authoritarian regimes, uh, quite brutal regimes, and also throw up some very fine, refined ideas about how people should deal justly with each other. But because each of those problems uh, emerged in particular contexts, the actual versions of justice uh, whilst they might be congruent and sort of similar, uh, they're not identical. It's very important mm -hmm. to recognise that the context in which they emerged leads to the, the differences, which I call precious. They're precious in the sense that it's very important to value and understand them. And they're also sort of precious in they're quite precise in the sense that they are located in their histories. But I would argue that it's very important we have a dialogue between different cultures and a dialogue between, um, uh, between different cultures and also philosophers of different times. Yeah. But the other thing, talking about globalisation, is that I think in our own history, we have uh, our, the, the values of justice um, emerged initially in city-states. Be before we go to this point, yes. uh, I, I want to go back to the connection between justice and universality. You just told us that, in fact, all theory of justice, all theories of justice, despite the differences, somehow uh, have a claim on universality. Yes. They want to present themselves uh, as universal. Uh, so that would be my uh, my question. Would be mm -hmm. why is it the case? Why why is this, uh, why do we have this very strong connection between uh, justice claims and? Uh, 
uh, a claim that uh, you know this claim is universal. And then the second point is that you told us that in fact, uh, uh, despite the differences existing among cultures, uh, somehow at the core of each culture there is uh, a, a sense of similarity um, uh, regarding what is considered uh, just right. So first point, what, how do you account for the fact that there is this strong link between justice and universality? Why is it so important? I think, I suppose, if you're making claims about justice, about how human beings should live, it's, um, it's, it's very natural to claim it for all, hum all human beings if you acknowledge others as being uh, people from other cultures as being uh, human beings. And, and, in, uh, and if you're going to be um, uh, emphasising the importance of the way humans deal with other human beings, uh, then uh, why limit it to just this family or this, this state or whatever? On the other hand, although there are always claims to universality, uh, they are always um, formed in particular times, in particular contexts. Uh, City-states, empires, sovereign states as we've had for the last uh, 350 years or so, and now in a more global community. And, uh, and that I think that the way in which the same kinds of issues play out uh, look rather different. And particularly, of course, also the institutions which will realise those values are different. The institutions which will realise um, uh, or attempt to realise justice within a city-state, within an empire, within a sovereign state or a global community uh, they, may, they may be quite different and there may be different mixes of institutions. So, so precisely then the question becomes how do you, how do you somehow uh, dovetail, articulate or, or uh, manage to have uh, these differences existing uh, between these, universali these universalities, how do you manage to have them entering into a dialogue? How do you make them compatible? Well I think of course um, uh, when entering a dialogue, I think is a really important thing, and I think that uh, I actually once said that universal values exist at the asymptote of infinite dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, and that I think that it's. Uh, but on the other hand, people don't need to completely agree. You don't need to have consensus uh, on values to uh, have agreement on action. Uh, we actually have it in democracies. We have it in the universe in uh, in international institutions where people can have different, re different reasons for coming to a similar conclusion. And particularly when it comes to sort of the, the different uh, views of justice in different communities, there'll often be a lot of, um, there'll be a lot of uh, similarity between certainly the more humanitarian version of justice found in Buddhism and Confucianism and, uh, and Islam and the West, uh, and that uh, it's, you don't have to reach complete agreement uh, it's important actually to recognise a difference, but that they are sufficiently close, I call them congruent, so that uh, we can work together and the dialogue can, can, can continue. But I think in the current globalising world, we have to recognise that many of the values of justice that we discuss were f formed in and for strong sovereign states. Although they were claimed to be universal, things like the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, um, uh, although in a sense its own universality, its limited universality was described within the idea of man, uh, they, um, uh, the Declaration of uh, uh, the uh, US Declaration of Independence. Yes. Uh, these are make general statements about all human beings, but of course the inst the uh, the institutions within which those values were propounded, were claimed, and implemented were uh, actually within sovereign within sovereign states. I think there was a, uh, initially, um, and I've often called the Enlightenment the Great Leap Forward uh, in the West, uh, quite advisedly because of uh, the much suffering that was caused by people in the West and especially to others who were not seen to have the benefit of these, uh, these justice institutions. Nonetheless, there was, a, there was I think, a, um, a, con a recognition that um, by certainly philosopher of justice and liberally minded politicians that these values should apply to all. And we, I think, came to this, um, uh, what I call the, the 1945 UN project, that every, sovereign, every people should be, a sovereign, should be a sovereign nation, every sovereign nation should be a uh, practitioner of human rights, and that this is, might be something we might move, move towards over, through, uh, through the decades. Uh, Globalisation has had a, um, a profound effect on this, 
in that the uh, huge mass, the movement of ideas, money, people, products, services across borders has made those borders, um, has tended to lower, not eliminate, but much lower those borders. And sovereign states are not the only game in town. Sovereign mm -hmm. states uh, are still very important. Uh, but um, uh, this has led to um, a lot of um, soul searching and angst by some. Some, some have suggested that this this means that well a lot of these a lot of these values of justice, especially uh, distributive justice, uh, don't work in a um, in a global world mm -hmm. which is dominated by movement of capital and people. Some have sort of wanted to bolster the sovereign state because they can achieve various forms of distributive justice. But I think that one should re recognise that sovereign states are an inadequate way of achieving universal mm -hmm. values. So I want to, to backtrack a little bit. So, so historically, uh, you tell us that uh, justice has really uh, been conceptualized and has developed uh, within the context of, uh, to speak broadly and, and in, 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 um, uh, very quickly, uh, within the context of the, of the nation state. Mm -hmm. uh, and then starting more or less in the 19th century, uh, and of course uh, all the more in the 20th century, we have witnessed uh, um, uh, attempts to internationalize uh, justice, so all the way to perhaps the uh, 1980s, and then we have globalization. So what have been the, 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 the challenges associated with trying to uh, uh, internationalize uh, uh, justice, which before had been essentially uh, conceived of and implemented at a national level? Um. And, 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 and as a way to perhaps uh, push you in the direction where I want to push you. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the paradoxes, I think, of the internationalization of justice, uh, which started in the, in the 19th century and then continued all the way to uh, uh, know, a few decades ago, is that somehow the internationalization of justice has also led, somehow, the, the, through self-determination, for instance, the, 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 the nationalization of part of the globe. So how do you go about uh, this kind of, uh, and for me, this is one of the challenges, how do you go about thinking and, and, and putting in place in a satisfactory manner uh, an internationalization of justice which goes about also partly uh, the creation of nation states across the globe? Uh, so creation of nation states across, across, across the globe? Yeah, I mean, you know, the independence, I mean, countries oh, yes. become independent and so on and so on. So, you know, on, on the one hand, I mean, uh, the inter internationalization of justice has been about making sure that values of human rights would, would become truly universal beyond the initial states where they, they appeared, but also uh, the internationalization of justice has been about creating uh, independent states. Oh, that's a question uh, of, 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 of group justice for yeah. states, yes. Um, I think that um, the first thing is, that, um, uh, is to recognize that there are international versions, issues, with all these kinds of uh, justice. Although just as I think that concept, conceptions of justice formulated in the city-states, uh, the ancient world, which much of the philosophy of government uh, so the, started, the, uh, was actually... Greek antiquity and... Uh, the Greeks and the Romans in particular. Yes. Um, there were a lot of um, ideals of justice and various forms of governance which were developed in the um, in that city-states. And in a sense, it was quite a significant philosophical transformation to change these into the much larger entities of sovereign states. This is particularly the case with uh, various elements of, of um, uh, citizenship and democracy, which were very clearly sort of understood within a city-state, but which many would see how on earth could you how on earth could you take the sort of the democratic uh, traditions of a city-state where people were all within uh, walking distance of each other to a sovereign state, especially in the 18th century, in which the thing is that even if they, even if they rode, uh, rode like the clappers, they would not, you know, it would be uh, two weeks before they got from the top of Scotland to, uh, to London uh, and much further on, further on the continent. And that's, of course, where democracy sort of took on, um, a switched from various d d d d direct, direct forms but to much more strictly uh, representative form. And uh, citizenship, of course, has uh, changed, changed, citizen made translation. So it's a question of things, these, when we move to a global world, uh, some, of these, some of these concepts are going to be uh, uh, highly problematic. You know, what does the citizenship mean in a, in a global world? 
what does um, a democracy mean, and particularly when it comes to the matters of distributive justice, yeah. uh, equality and so forth. Uh, now there's a lot of debates about what kind of equality should be provided to citizens of the United States or to Germany, England or Australia. Uh, but the thing is that what kind of equality uh, should be expected within a global system? Why should the, why should the welfare rights of a citizen of, uh, in, an, in a poor African country be possibly arguably a thousandth that of uh, somebody in Germany? And in fact, why should the welfare rights of somebody in Germany be maybe twice that of somebody sleeping in the grates outside this building? And, and that's where the distinction between international justice and global justice uh, comes into play and is relevant. In, in, in essence, international justice is, is very much focused on uh, interstate justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why in this context, uh, just for theory is very, very important, while mm -hmm. global justice uh, somehow uh, wants to bring to the fore uh, issues of distribution and the four issues of economic justice at the global level, right? And that's where perhaps the issue of uh, globalization comes into play. And, and precisely in this context, what are the, 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 the pluses and minuses uh, brought about by globalization uh, in the context of global justice? I mean. In other words, I mean, uh, how does globalization help uh, the global justice agenda as being a bit different from the international justice agenda, and how does it undermine the global justice agenda? I see it in some sense as being in a similar position now to um, the um, informed and active citizens in the early 18th century, except because they didn't call themselves citizens, they were considered to be subjects in those days. That uh, with the world of sovereign states emerged um, in Europe, uh, the 16th, 17th century, everybody gives a date, 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, but that's, if you like, just a date in, in a process. Certainly by the 18th century, though, uh, there was um, a system of sovereign states that had been more or less um, affected within, within Europe. Uh, and uh, some people have done very well out of it, some people have done very badly out of it. Uh, the predominant philosophy of uh, sovereign states was a highly authoritarian one. Uh, that, um, uh, as Thomas Hobbes I describe as the uh, philosopher of record, who said that human beings would uh, contract with each other uh, to create above them an all-powerful sovereign uh, so they wouldn't kill each other uh, incessantly. Now, at the beginning of the 18th century, some were starting to say, well, it doesn't. Ha it could be better than that. And that's when there was the prop proposition of what we'd now recognise a lot of these theories of procedural and distributive justice uh, as uh, ways in which the, uh, the system of sovereign states could be more civilised um, and more, uh, more um, respecting and reflective and supporting of their members. And in fact, this is the, what I call is the there's a Feuerbachian shift between uh, the 17th century conception that uh, there was a sovereign and they had subjects, and the 18th century, this sudden twist, no, it's the other way around, sorry. It's not the subjects that have to justify themselves to uh, sovereigns. It's that states have to justify themselves to citizens. And there's a fundamental leap, and I think a fundamental, and for all the weaknesses and all the misery created by other elements of the Enlightenment, that's a true shining light there. But I think we have to recognise now that it's not just a world of sovereign states. There are other players, the corporations, NGOs, international agencies, some good, some bad. Uh, there are some people who have done tremendously well out of this more globalised world. There are some who have done right very badly. We need what I would argue is a global Enlightenment. To, it, to look at what are the values that should be imposed on this international system, uh, uh, what, they, what they should be, what their content should be, and what the institution should be that will realise these visions of global justice. But it's not going to be Western philosophers doing it. It's got to, got to be a genuine dialogue between different, different cultural traditions to find uh, not just out of what's been in the past, but out of new uh, concepts uh, of uh, justice. What are the appropriate ones to civilize this world of global So, so precisely, are you quite optimistic about the possibility of this dialogue? Uh, because in a way, you know, when we are uh, witnessing the rise of, of new powers coming from Asia, for instance, China, uh, among others, I mean, you know, in a way, uh, we are celebrating, and these countries are, are celebrating their rise as nations. So it's not necessarily really something which goes in the direction of, uh, of uh, 
um, the demise of the nation state and so on. So are you optimistic about uh, the possibility of this dialogue? And, and if so, what would be the ways for this dialogue to take place? Um, interesting. Optimism is about prediction, mm -hmm. uh, whereas um, uh, often the point is action. Uh, and um, I think that it's certainly possible uh, to have these dialogues. I think there's a great interest, there's an interest uh, in the countries of the West who will, which will in the future not have such a central place and certainly won't be able to dictate to others. Uh, but it's also in the interest of the thing is the emerging societies you describe um, have, a, um, have a deep interest in a functioning international system and most of them actually do generally want improved lives for the peoples that are part of them. Uh, China is a fascinating uh, example, although it has many author authoritarian streaks. On the other hand, it's actually based on a philosophy that, um, that the workers' lives should be improved. Now, there's uh, obviously that the means they, they, they had to doing that uh, failed. But on the other hand, there are still some, uh, there is there's still, uh, I think, some of those values with it. And it's good if they don't lose it. Mm -hmm. I think, if you like, there's a, there's a lot of com uh, commonality in the sense that Western, Western nations claim that they exist to benefit their citizens. And that's a claim that most states do uh, make in various ways. And I think, uh, but again, I think as far as the international system is concerned, uh, China and India want a functioning international, international system in which they can, they can, they can, they can grow, and grow and develop. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room for optimism, uh, certainly the, the, the dialogue. Um, I think that the question is, will, will, the, will the results of the dialogue be, be, actually, be actually picked up? It's a bit like, will the, uh, you know, in the 18th century, mm -hmm. uh, would the ideas, the philosophes be, uh, be, become part of politics, or would they be suppressed? In some countries they were, in some countries they won't. Globally, of course, there's only one, one global society. And, and it's a multi-directional dialogue, if one can say, because it's about dialing, uh, entering into, into a dialogue with the past uh, and, and with other cultures and so on. Earlier you mentioned that, in fact, the categories which we're using as a way to think about justice uh, uh, for today and for tomorrow are perhaps not suited anymore. You mentioned that uh, uh, you know, the category of citizens, uh, the category of, uh, of, um, of democracy, the category of representation, the category of participation perhaps are not really uh, suited to what will be the future about. So how do we go about preparing the future, preparing ourselves, uh, you know, the next generation, uh, while having uh, in hand these categories which are not properly uh, fully suited? How do we uh, midwife, if you will, <laughs> the future out of categories which are a bit uh, ill-suited? So how do we... I'm optimistic that it can be done, and in fact, to some extent, looking at the, if you like, the work was done on concepts of citizenship and democracy, which mm -hmm. were originally those of small city-states. Uh, and actually, when Rome became a large, uh, became, a, uh, became a republic with an empire, its city-state failed. Its institutions failed. It became an empire, highly authoritarian. So, so we uh, don't have to be the prisoners of our intellectual category. Exactly. But in fact, the, if you like, maybe the triumph of the uh, limited though it was of the 18th century is that they actually took concepts like citizenship and democracy and the rule of law uh, from city-states and translated them and found genuine meaning in a larger world. And so that and issues like... Um, issues like uh, citizenship and democracy in some sense can be seen as citizenship as a sense of belonging to the important institutions of which, uh, which are relevant to your world and democracy is about having a say in them. Mm -hmm. So to some extent the thing is that if sovereign states are the only, the only game in town then democracy means having a say in uh, the decisions of state and citizenship means membership of that particular state. But if in fact the sovereign state is not the only game in town, there are other institutions, then the same basic value of belonging and say then need to be translated to the significant institutions uh, that make up the global world. So, so uh, you know, in, in a sense, you are telling us that you know we shouldn't be focusing. You know, the, the we have to to try to understand what uh, the concepts are, are, are serving, expressing in terms of the values which we value, and so. For you, you know, citizenship and so on, it's about uh, belonging, having a say and so on. And if the, the, the settings in which uh, so far we have uh, uh, implemented these uh, uh, values, you know, which, which are giving meaning to these concepts uh, are not really appropriate anymore, then we have to think about uh, uh, 
uh, new settings which would express this sense of his demand for belonging, his demand for belonging and, and for having a say, right? I agree, and I think that's, uh, that's part of the... Uh, I hope the midwifery doesn't produce a monster, uh, but I, I, I think that if we th think in those terms that here are sort of some basic values. I don't believe that going back, oh, fundamentally it's trying to define in belonging or say. I think it's more a matter that it, within that, that institutional setting there are sort of values of democracy and citizenship. Here will, in a new setting, there are going to be, we might call them democracy or citizenship, but there will be something similar. And I think whatever happens, the thing is that if you look at those four different kinds of justice that we talked, uh, talked before, there are really important issues we have today in all of those. And I think that um, uh, we can recognise in some sense similarities and in some senses differences because of the institutional structures. And if you like, it might be useful to sort of look at issues of distri dist distributive justice, retributive justice, restorative justice and procedural justice that we need to look at today in, uh, in our world of, um, in our uh, w a complex world in which there are global and international institutions, national, subnational corporations and NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, all of which are relevant in the interplay of forces of what actually will either deliver justice or injustice. Uh, the, the, t taking the, the uh, global justice agenda seriously, mm -hmm. does it mean somehow uh, putting together uh, a global structure, global norms, global values and so on, uh, which would be uh, possible without having uh, the need for us to revisit uh, the, uh, the, 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 the structure, the identity of nation states. In, in essence, can we, can we think about uh, uh, taking seriously a global justice agenda seriously uh, and, 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 and keep uh, the, the, the nation state uh, order as it is? Or, well, or somehow, uh, you know, uh, in order for, for global justice to be taken seriously, somehow things will have to change at the national level. Well, I think the thing is that things are changing at the national level. When you say this system of sovereign states as it is, mm -hmm. I mean, as it is now, as it was 10 years ago, as it is in 10 years, or as it is theorised to be, uh, I think these are changing. Uh, and I think this is the institutional context which is changing. If I can go back, so if you look at issues of global justice, which look at uh, universal values uh, uh, and uh, achieved across the globe, one of the interesting things is that they're not going to be achieved just by one set of institutions. I think one of the uh, conceits of the period of sovereign states is that sovereign states were the only game in town and everything that mattered happened through sovereign states. In fact, the thing is that uh, those sovereign states, certainly in the 18th century, even now, are highly complex. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is, uh, the state is obviously a really important actor but there are lots of other important institutions and uh, groups uh, from, um, as Robert Putnam would say, from choirs up to, uh, up to multinational corporations. And so sovereign states were always more complicated than they're imagined to be. And if you want to achieve justice within a sovereign state, it wasn't just a matter of justice in state institutions, but also the way in which uh, in churches um, uh, and religious groups, uh, corporations as they emerged, unions, uh, professions and so forth operate. And so I think that if you look at a question for global justice, uh, like um, those um, uh, which we might look at in a moment, uh, issues of uh, uh, welfare of those who are least well off and so forth, the way in which that you will, you will achieve justice is actually going to be by a mixture of international organisations with the UN will, I'm sure, um, have a very important role if any of these uh, re uh, goals to be achieved. Uh, sovereign states, corporations, NGOs and so forth. Uh, if you look at sort of um, the way in which uh, the, worst, the worst sufferings of uh, peoples have been ameliorated um, over the last, uh, the last few decades, um, the UN has had a really important role. Um, but it couldn't do it by itself. In fact, it has largely a coordinating and a norm-finding role. One thing I often say is that for those who are uh, rather depressed about the success of the United Nations, that in many ways the United Nations has managed to put a floor under human mi misery. Um, to sound slightly biblical, biblical the, uh, the uh, disasters of uh, famine, pestilence and war, which used to regularly denude populations, um, they're not 
they haven't disappeared, but they've been massively ameliorated. And UN organisations, uh, uh, FAO for famine, uh, WHO for health, uh, the Security Council for, uh, for war, uh, have played a very important role in actually reducing those, uh, those, those kinds of disasters. But it's not as if those did, a UN body did it by itself. There were state organisations, yeah. corporate actors, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly so some really, really important NGOs. And so I think that that's, if you like, the model, if we sort of look at how are certain values going to be achieved. Uh, it's going to be by a mixture of uh, global institutions, uh, national institutions, corporations and uh, professional organisations and uh, NGOs. Um, and it might be worthwhile thinking what some of the challenges, uh, justice challenges for the international system are. Because obviously uh, these matters have been debated and discussed and uh, whilst there's no agreement within nation states, and recognise this for a future global order, uh, it's possible to achieve uh, really pr pretty effective justice systems uh, to have a high degree of, um, uh, of um, distributive justice within uh, advanced countries, uh, to have um, uh, procedural justice um, at actually a very, very, very high level, uh, achieving a degree of restorative justice and agreeing retributive justice, whilst within those sovereign states there's huge mm -hmm. differences about the definition of justice. Even uh, not just Christian philosophers disagreeing, but the, uh, the more simplified versions that appear in public debate. There can be a lot of debate about it, but nonetheless you can achieve a lot, as we have seen, uh, in terms of greater distributive justice, greater procedural justice in particular. Uh, and so I think this will be the case in the world. There'll, people will be debating to the end of time the details of various forms, yeah. of, uh, forms of justice, but it doesn't prevent people actually combining, uh, various institutions combining, to uh, improve justice, if never perfected. You, you talked about dialogue earlier, and so of course at the global level there are two, two major gaps. Uh, one. Uh, uh, existing between the West and the non-Western world, and the other one uh, uh, having to do with uh, developed and developing countries. So, the the, the dialogue that you are calling for, um, you know, how do you uh, go about these two gaps, and uh, uh, is there a way to somehow uh, uh, create a matrix, uh, you know, between these two types of gaps in terms of dialogue? Should we should we address them separately or or do they have to be addressed in a in a in a, in a uh, together? Um, I think that it's um, uh, in fact, of course, Western, uh, non-Western, and developed developing, uh, they've they're, they're obviously overlapping mm -hmm. uh, variations. The good thing is that they're actually the overlap is uh, is disappearing as. Uh, as non-Western countries, some of Western yeah. countries have become much, much stronger. I think this dialogue uh, exists and continues mm -hmm. uh, in informal ways and some more formal ways in terms of uh, uh, various various initiatives by various attempts to promote this dialogue. Uh, the dialogue, of course, happens not just in, in a in a in a, um, in a formal sense, uh, but also in a formal sense. In a sense, those sort of like philosophers often do, they'll pose questions. <coughs> And uh, they won't just give the answer. That philosophers love actually debating, debating questions forever. Uh, but at least they pose the question. Uh, then it's a matter of um, it's a matter of politicians and uh, um, uh, intellectuals to help uh, and ordinary people to engage in this debate and say basically, well, what are the values that should drive uh, a new, more global society? I say a more global society. What are the values that should drive them, and what are the institutions that will uh, that will achieve them? And, and how do you go about uh, these values? Uh, how do you go about uh, projecting a, a sense of what is right without being self-righteous? Because this is clearly what has been the challenge for the West, uh, uh, you know, pursuing something uh, which, which it feels is right, while being at the same time perceived by the non-West as being self-righteous. So how do you go about? Uh, conceiving of and pursuing something which you see as right, which you see as right, while not being self-righteous. What, what are the? What is the device uh, to well, make to some it happen? Extent, in the dialogue, of course, it's not. The first thing is is not for is not for the West, Westerners to judge their own actions, mm -hmm. um, because in that case it will be a matter of being self-righteous. 
uh, in the dialogue, you say if somebody sees that action differently, it's very important to understand what they mean and what their, what their criticism is. Uh, maybe, of course, things, the way you set it up is it's the West is acting, and uh, well, is the way the West is acting just. Uh, we may find that uh, the Western countries are not quite so powerful, and we'll be asked in the same way of others. I think it's absolutely critical, though, is that uh, in one sense, um, even though you don't get um, an agreement on uh, what are universal values, it's very important that you uh, project them as universal values and very much that they apply to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that sometimes, sometimes in the So a bit of West, re re reflexivity. Yeah, but also if, if there is a rule um, and we say somebody else should follow that rule, it's terribly important we follow that rule ourselves. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's basic rule of law principle. And it's important that we also uh, try to create the institutions that ensure that we do follow that rule. That's the lesson within sovereign states, of course, is it's not just a matter of a sovereign saying, I'll be good. It's a question of uh, actually having democratic procedures to determine what action the sovereign will take and also to ensure that there are independent bodies to adjudicate mm -hmm. whether the sovereign is, uh, is following, following the rules that have been set. And so it is for sovereign states, whether they be west or east. Anyone with power uh, mm -hmm. uh, should see themselves as deriving that power from, uh, from law and, from, uh, and should be subject to that law and subject to independent adjudication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but this is true with justice as with other global values. Uh, there's plenty of discussion about global values and there's often a high degree of agreement. And sometimes the problem is that um, is that the um, uh, that people are very uh, states are willing to agree to a matter of principle, uh, but not to the institutions that will ensure that that principle binds them. Yeah. But I think that is uh, that is uh, a critical part. That's part of procedural justice. Uh, and so, one thing we might do, as if 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 I, if I may suggest, is that we look through some of the. Uh, those the, the, the categories of justice and see that they are highly relevant for, uh, for, today, for a global world. Uh, that although many of these issues were debated and imagined and institutionalised um, within a sovereign state, uh, it's very important uh, there are similar issues that uh, apply globally. So that would be an agenda for the future? I think so, and can I suggest? Yeah, a few? can you yes. give us a? Uh, I think that when it comes to matters of uh, matters of distributive justice, the one I mentioned before is that uh, justice of uh, within sovereign states. That why should you know one, why should some be very poor and some be very rich? <coughs> Although things like no, 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 no states have actually gone for complete egalitarianism, and the few that have have not succeeded. Nonetheless, they're sort of seen as being a claim of all persons within that community to at least a minimum standard of life. And there's debates about what the minimum mm -hmm. and actually proper debates about it. But that point I made before about why should the why should the citizens of some of the weakest countries economically have uh, life expectations so hugely different uh, yeah. from others. There's also a question I think that um, uh, very very uh, very topical now. Uh, people talk about carbon trading or carbon taxing schemes and what should we do after, after Kyoto? I know there's going to be a uh, series of discussions uh, the UN is promoting about uh, Kyoto plus 20, but uh, take one of the standard responses to climate change that suggests, oh, we should have a carbon trading system uh, and that, the, um, that uh, those who have um, countries that have done a lot of uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions in the past should actually gradually reduce theirs and that so others that. shouldn't increase theirs. But if you're going to have a carbon trading system, you have to create property rights in emissions. And it means that you'd end up creating, giving uh, uh, a highly unequal distribution of property rights uh, to emit carbon and giving most of them to those who are actually creating most of the problem. Now, as a matter of justice and um, distributive justice, it's very hard to sort of see how that makes sense. Now, I think that these are, um, uh, like, of course, things that it's not as if sovereign states are completely just. But on the other hand, it's a really important issue of distributive justice, not just the things that ordinary welfare rights, but when new rights are being created, why should, uh, why should countries who have omitted the most in the past be given actually more property rights yeah. in doing so in the future?